This series is written chronologically. If you are new to the series, you should start at Season 1, Episode 1. Thank you. The Blood Drawn Chronicles, Season 4, Remnants of the Forgotten, was written by Michael Bradley and produced by Digifox Studios. If you'd like to contribute towards our next season, titled Season 5, Origins Unveiled, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash tbdc and take advantage of the awesome perks we have available, such as exclusive director's notes from every episode, concept art, plus bonus extra episodes, and more. As always, thank you for listening. And now, our story begins. August 8th, 1690. My tempered traveling companion had retired to her room hours ago. Now, mildly past midnight, seems as good a time as any to explore the mind of this town's beloved priest. His churchly duties have demanded him well into the late of night, and thus he retired to his quarters less than an hour ago. One would think that given my extensive time in man's world, I would familiarize myself greatly with their daily habits, but, alas, I am still as ignorant as ever to the concept of sleep. What is sleep, and why does man require it so? Diophilus's book defines sleep as a condition of body and mind such as that which, typically, reoccurs for several hours every night, in which the nervous system is relatively inactive, the eyes closed, the posterior muscles relaxed, and consciousness practically suspended. In essence, I am familiar with, at the very least, the definition, but the reason itself floors me. A Valpyr need never enter such a state, and though in my world our houses do indeed contain bedrooms, the purpose of these rooms is purely for consummation, or coital relations, if you will. Thus we sorely lack in the sleep department, making the concept of dreaming elude us. As I enter the priest's room, as mist seeping through the cracks in the door, I take the opportunity to gather my recent thoughts into a single question before composing myself to a man once more. What is dreaming? I've matched the definition on more than one occasion while I've been in this world, my nervous system was relatively inactive, my eyes closed, my posterior muscles relaxed, and my consciousness practically suspended as well, yet I never dreamt. I looked down at the priest as I stood by the side of the bed where he slept. I conclude by his sprawled posture that he has entered the actual state I question, and I find myself mildly envious, per se, that he dreams whilst I inquire the very act. Brushing off my jealousy, I remind myself of my agenda. Placing my right hand on his forehead, I enter the private chambers of his mind. I scoured through his memories until finally I found the one of he and my tempered companion. We relive the moment, my presence unnoticed like a fly on the wall. She enters the chapel, ignoring whether vacant or occupied, she walks forward until right in front of the statue of the man on the cross. She gazes heavily at the thorn-crowned bloody figure. Taking notice, the priest approaches her. What's this? Tears running down her cheeks, an emotion from her I've yet to witness for myself. The priest, now standing in front of her, extends his hand. She responds by taking the hand which was offered, and at that moment I feel the connection made. The slight moment that their hands first make contact, I feel the energy transfer from a single point in his cerebrum to hers. And in a single instant, 
she has loaded her mind with the knowledge of his native tongue. This girl is truly a fascinating creature. Now that speech is clearly no obstacle, I watch as the memory unfolds. There, there, my child. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's just, this statue bears a striking resemblance to... She pauses mid-conversation and approaches the statue, placing her hand on its face. Both the priest and I were a look of confusion. Slowly, she begins again, saying, It's only the eyes that are the same. He was taller, stockier. He wore his beard longer, braided at the ends. His hair was long, straight, and the most lively color of blue your mind could imagine. In his presence, you couldn't help but feel inferior. But I never felt that way. To him, I was his princess. And he loved me more than words could convey. Who? <laughs> my... my father. She begins to cry. Taken by her sorrow, the priest welcomes her in his arms, saying... It's going to be all right, my dear. Everything is going to be all right. I can see from your pain that you've lost him. Not just him. My mother, my sister, my entire family, all gone. I am all that remains. <laughs> Indeed, it is a tragedy when we lose a loved one. And the loss of an entire family is the greatest of all afflictions. But... You have no need for sorrow, for the Holy Spirit assures me that your family is well. They're in heaven now, and they're looking down upon you, smiling. No, they are not. Why do you say such things, child? Because I have seen the world of the dead, and once the deceased pass through the gates of Caleb's, they lose all ties to the world of the living. Her response baffles me far more than the priest, who brushes it off as nothing more than paranoic babblery. The gates of Kalos are mentioned in the Book of Orion. I remember reciting the very passage during my learning hour in my youth. Orion, Chapter 5, Verses 17 through 19 And so it was that an angel of Olumdor appeared before the fourth-born son of Adlam, and said unto him, I appear before thee, Orion, son of Adlam, for thou must right the wrongs of thy father, whose actions have littered the rainbow road to the pearly gates of Kalos. Kalos is the most popular of the ten realms of Olumdor, the world of the dead. I recall telling Dragon, the Horde King himself, that I would send him to the gates of Kalos, where he would wait to be judged, that they would mock him for thinking he could kill a Valpyr. How is it that this girl knows of the realms of Olumdor, which to my knowledge is only mentioned in the Book of Orion? Is she? No. I refuse to believe she is from my world. As I reflect within a reflection, I am returned to the memory staged in front of me by the one question the priest asks that I long to know. What is your name, child? Alas, she wipes the last of her tears from her face and answers the great question, saying, my name is Alana. After stating her name, she returned her demeanor momentarily to the girl I know her as. Firm, fierce, relentless. But then, soon after, the sight of her I've never seen before. Her face, now gentle, warming, sincere, and for the first time, she smiled. 
and I stood there, a pompous witness to true beauty. I withdraw my hand from the priest's forehead and return to the real world. If that is what dreaming is like, I envy mankind. I exit his bedroom and make my way to the bench, which is my bed for the night. Time passes, and I find myself staring heavily into the eyes of the statue of the thorn-crowned man upon the cross. Slowly, my mind begins formulating an image of Alana's father. Such a man has never existed in my world. All throughout history the Valpyr have ruled. Yet before my eyes stands the image of a king. Perhaps my own imagination deceives me. Perhaps Alana's father was no more than a peasant, a lonely member of society, a simple flea beggar. Or perhaps not. One thing is certain. This man and his daughter are not of my world. And now that begs the question yet again. Where is she from? So deep are my thoughts that I was left unaware to the growing scent of garlic that filled the room. I turn to find the priest awoken, holding a lit garlic-scented candle an elbow's length from my face. He looks at me, perplexed, and asks, What are you still doing up at this hour? I am unable to sleep. Ah. <sighs> I am as well. I find prayer usually helps me in these situations. Care to join me? Prayer won't help me. Prayer helps everyone. The Lord listens and he answers. He may not always answer on our time, but he answers when he knows it's the right time. And what if your God was a woman? What if she was angry with you for no given reason? Would you then still pray? I beg your pardon? What if, instead of a male cross-hung god who has all the time in the world to listen, you instead worshipped a goddess of fortune whose days are flooded with prayers for those she only fancies listening? Who in their right mind would worship a god like that? Who in their right mind indeed? What are you getting at, Mr. Myrick? I have spent my entire life devoted to the worship of Lady Fate, Eleonora, goddess of fate, fortune, and wonder. I thought, as a humble servant, she would reward me, but the opposite occurs. Can you answer why? Can your god? Or like myself, is it beyond him? I don't know the answer. But what I do know is that nothing is beyond him. Unlike your goddess, he has no limits, no restrictions. He is a god of everything. No question is too great for him. All you need do is ask him yourself. If your god is truly god of everything, then believe me when I say he will never answer. Why do you say such things? Because, unlike yourself, I know and admit the truth. And what truth is that? I am not the center of the universe. Good night, priest. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to like, share, comment, and most importantly, subscribe.